Good morning, church. Good morning. I might, well, hey, we're right on time, 10 o'clock. Thank you for those of you, <laughs> hallelujah, boy, this is going to be a lively house today, hallelujah. I'm glad you're here this morning, thank you for joining us, we're going to believe God for great and mighty things. How many of you believe God is an awesome God who wants to do more than we could ask or imagine? Amen. I am, I am excited about it. I know uh, folks will be trickling in, and, uh, but Jesus is already here. The place is warmed up. The hearts of people are stirred, and we're excited about the good things God's going to do. Uh, we're going to be uh, praying for students today, and so we've got a bunch of them here in the front. That's a good thing. You know, school starts this week, and uh, if you are a parent of a school-aged child, you're very well aware of that. Uh, but uh, we want to pray for them here a little bit uh, later in our service. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me. Let's invite the Lord's presence once again, and then we're going to move right into some time to just worship Jesus. Father God, we thank you today that you are here in this house, God, that you love us, God, that you have us in your hearts. Jesus, that every one of us is a, a, your divine and unique creation. God, we're created in your image and likeness. God, created to do good works in Christ, which you have ordained for us to do in advance. Oh, God, today may we fulfill your purposes. God, you've brought us together for such a time as this. And so, Holy Spirit, we invite you now to come and put a fire in our souls, God. Anoint our worship team. May the joy of the Lord well up in our hearts today. God, may we press and, and just push aside every distraction and hindrance and fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Come, Holy Spirit, fill this house. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship the Lord. I praise in the valley and praise on the mountain. I praise when I'm sure Number and praise when and surrounded. Cause praise is the water my enemies drown in. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise the Lord of oh my soul.
We just give you praise, Father God. You are so worthy of all our praise and honor and adoration, Jesus. Let's just give him a shout of praise. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah to you, Jesus. You're an awesome God.
what battle you are fighting, just know we know that God has it in control. God has the victory. We may not see it when we turn the news on, but none of this is any surprise to God. So we have to know and believe that God has this all under control. stop my my piano is not transposed as it should have I it's saying I'm in the right key but it's not and we're in the wrong rhythm <laughs> it's okay we're gonna start it over because I don't want to mess it up all the way through and I, I can't play it because it's not transposing back so we're gonna just go ahead and let you guys do it it's all right
just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. Sing that again. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart, over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Oh, I just want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus cause your name is power your name is sing that again and we're going to declare this oh i just want to speak the name of jesus home of fear and all anxiety to every soul have captive by depression
is power. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is mine. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadow. Jesus, over every heart and every mind, cause I know there is peace within His presence, I speak Jesus, is Jesus. There's no other name but the name of Jesus. There's just power, and there's victory. There's victory over every situation in your life. If you need a healing, if you have anxiety, if you have depression, if you need a miracle in your life, this altar is open. You can come and kneel down here. We won't make you tell us what it is. If you need prayer and you just need to let Jesus have it all and just let it go and let him give you your victory, this altar is open. You can sit at your own seats and pray. But Father God, we come against anxiety. We come against depression. Father, I pray that if there's a healing that is needed in this house today, that your healing power would flow from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet. Mend the brokenhearted. Set your people free. Hallelujah. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind because I do know that there's peace within his presence I speak Jesus right now I just want everyone just to say Jesus 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 There's nothing more powerful than that name, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Every stronghold, Jesus. Jesus. Yes. Oh, Jesus. We just bring it to you, Lord. That thing that the enemy has been taunting us with, the attempts to bring fear. Right now, Jesus, we just speak your name over every threat that the enemy has tried to put upon us. That school is going to be more than I can handle. That my family's a disaster. That my health is a mess. That people don't care about me. God, whatever threat, whatever lie the enemy has foisted upon your people, God, today, in Jesus' name, we just bring it captive to the obedience of Christ. And God, we thank you that you are our healer, our sustainer, our provider. God, you are everything that we need. And we thank you, Lord. Thank you for that incredible power on behalf of us who believe. Holy Spirit, just flow across the house today. If there's a word, God, uh, a gift that you want to use today, an exhortation. God, let our hearts be open to that. And speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. If you've got a word, just lift a hand. We've got John back there with the microphone. Lord, we just thank you that you speak. Yes, Lydia, over here, John. This week, 
the words holy and righteous have been going through my spirit and through my mind just over and over again. And with the songs that we sang this morning, it just brings it more to light. He is holy. He is righteous. The God that is holy and righteous. There is none other. Our praise needs to be lifted to the one and only God. And like we sang, he is the one that we go to yes. when we need to have addictions broken up, strongholds removed. Yes. He is the God. It's through Jesus, the blood of Jesus, it's the only way that this is possible. You bring it under the blood. Jesus, yeah. God, you are the only one that is holy and righteous. And yet we can be too through the blood. Yes. We praise you, Jesus. Somebody else, do you feel like God's got a word that you want to share? Just lift a hand. Got a testimony of something God did that you just like, people need to hear this. Anybody else there? Willard? Rick's exhortation to us men yesterday morning has really uh, caused me to uh, look with eyes to see and that song turn your eyes upon Jesus and the lyrics of that just brings us back to that where we walk away and intentionally lay down the phone turn off the TV and we get alone with God and he gives us eyes to see Rick was so good at just exhortating us to uh, see with eyes because God is ever present with us he will never ever leave us nor forsake us but it's our my responsibility to see Jesus with eyes I didn't see before just like he seen the the man with the uh, green and gold jacket that was the word that confirmed Rick's uh, eyes the the two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus their eyes were constrained that they didn't see Jesus until afterwards and then we see Jesus the Paul's prayer to the Ephesians was that with the eyes of our understanding might be opened yes. and we see Jesus and that that is my word to all of us that we would see Jesus God bless y'all may be seated thank you for sharing thank you for worshiping thank you team for serving us Tara is your keyboard back is it okay I just un I undid it and started it all over again all right technology gotta love it well we're going to receive our tithes and our offerings at this time this is the uh, second Sunday of the month so it's mission Sunday thank you for your faithfulness to uh to world evangelism through your giving and uh, we're going to pray, and then the team will lead us in a song, and you can just bring your gifts forward today. Some of you have already done that. Thank you for that. And uh, just appreciate your faithfulness to God's house. Let's pray. Father, thank you for supplying all of our needs. God, we have just chosen to, to just believe what the Word says, that our God shall supply all of our needs according to His glorious riches in Christ Jesus. So, Lord, we ask now that you would bless these gifts, bless these missions offerings, God. Thank you for the missionaries with the flags around our sanctuary that remind us of them and their service. God, bless and anoint them. Put fresh fire in their souls today. God, let them know that the church is back home. We love them. We appreciate them, God. Anoint them, God. Use Jay Covert in the inner cities and Andrea um, uh, over in, in Asia, Father God. Anoint her, God. Put fire in her soul. Thank you for the Woolies in Ecuador. God, thank you for Jesus is the Way prison ministries. God, thank you for all of these outreaches, God, that we support here in the States and around the world. 
Bless and anoint their work, Father God. Keep them encouraged, and may they have a great harvest of souls. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can bring your gifts. God who's on our side. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, uh, before I preach today, we're going to pray for students. It's been a while since I've been a student, but I can remember the anxiety. Do I have the right shoes? Do I have the right pants? You know, do I have all the stuff I need and who's going to sit by me and all the stresses that come along with it and so uh, Tara suggested that we take this Sunday before school starts, at least in Tuscola, starts on Tuesday. And so uh, I'm going to turn it over to Tara, and she's going to lead us in praying for our students. With having two teenage daughters, I get to hear all of those exact things. You know, we've got to get this, and we have to get that. And all of those things are important to send our kids to school with the right things. It may sound silly, but if our kids are confident in what they have... If they know that they're wearing the clothes that everybody else is wearing and they're not going to be made fun of, that's one less dress. So those things are all very, very, very important. But the most important thing is that they know that no matter what they're going through when they walk through those doors, that they're one prayer away. All they have to do is pray and God will heal those anxieties. I know that it's been a struggle for many, many young people. They minute, the minute they get near the school doors, they're just like, oh, 
what's going to happen today. It may not even happen to them, but it happens to their friends. And every day you see your friends doing things that you know that you don't agree with. And they're doing things that are harmful to their own body. And that hurts. That hurts. You don't want to see your friends like going down that path to where they'll, they'll, they can end up dead or in prison. And it's a real thing. It, it used to, it was just like in high school when those things started. It's in the fourth grade. It's in the third grade. These kids today are see, seeing challenges we never dreamed about when we were in school. Kids in the first and second grade are talking about things that I don't think anybody in our school talked about till we were in high school. So today, I would like for as many that could, I would like for all of our young people just to come right across here. You can face me. You don't have to face the sanctuary. So all of our kids going to school, whether it's preschool, up to college, if you want to come up here, and if the parents want to join them, I would also ask that the parents join them. Because you know what? It's tough on the parents, too. Because it's really hard to see your kids hurt. You guys can come on up. Yeah. Ron, can you come and stand in place with our kids, please? Come on up. Emery, are you starting kindergarten? We can pray from here, but I think Emery's starting kindergarten this year, right? Yeah. We'll be praying for her, too. Anybody else, just come on up, and I would love for We're not going to call anybody out, I promise. Miss Dawn is going to just sing, the Lord bless you and keep you. Just sing, the Lord bless you and keep you. Just over and over. You don't have to, in the amens. <sighs> Homeschool can be tough, especially on the moms. But it's tough on the young ones, too. So, Father God, I pray right now that you will give him a supernatural intelligence. That you will learn far beyond your years and that your mama will teach you greater things than just the studies of school but she will raise you up like she is in the church and one day you my dear are going to be mighty a mighty man of God in this church in whatever church you go to you're going to speak words and you're going to teach and you're going to preach there's going to be people, many, many people saved and go to heaven because of you and Jesus inside of you. Bless him, Jesus. Lord, I pray for you. I pray right now that in the name of Jesus, that school will be easy for you. You will be able to sit still and you will be able to learn like you've never been able to learn before. We speak peace. Father God, I pray your blessings upon her, that this will be a great school year, and that she will be my year, and my year, and my year, and my year, that she will learn the things she needs to learn, and she will speak when she needs to speak, and be quiet when she's to be quiet. Lord, bless her and keep her. Father God, I pray for all of these kids that are going to high school, Lord Jesus. I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you will give them the strength to say no, to go places that they know that they shouldn't go. And, Lord, I pray that they will be a mighty, mighty light for you. And, that Lord, I pray that they will be able to speak Jesus in those hallways and that they will see that they are different. They are not part of this world. They have, they have to live in this world, but we are not the world. Lord, I pray that you will bless them and you will keep them. Lord, I pray against any anxiety and any fear and anything that will cause them to not be able to walk through those doors without your peace. In Jesus' mighty name, Lord, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that school will be easy. That those classes that they think are going to be too difficult, Lord, that it will be easy. In Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray that as our new students come to this new school, Lord, I pray right now that they will not have any fear, they will not have any anxiety, but Lord, that they will be able to walk through those doors with the confidence, confidence of Jesus. That they will walk through those halls and they will be a shining light in this dark dark world. Lord, I pray that you will just give them the peace that passes all understanding. You've 
got this. Come on, we got to get them. All right, Lord Jesus, we pray for Issa and Alex, Lord, as they do things, Lord. We know that Alex has a lot of stuff on his plate. But, Lord, we know that he can handle it with your help, Jesus. So let his studies not fail him. But, Lord, that he will be able to study and do his sports, and you will bless him. Lord, we pray for Issa that school will be easy. In Jesus' name, amen. Go before he kills his brother. Father God, we love you, Jesus. We pray for our teachers that are starting the school year out, Lord, that if they're saying things that come against your word, Lord, that they will be stopped, that there will be nothing taught in those schools that come against your word, especially things that are going on in their own private lives, Lord, that those things will be completely separated, that those things will not even enter our kids' kids' minds and in, our, in their spirits. But, Father God, that they will teach the curriculum and the curriculum only and lord if there's curriculum in that school that shouldn't be lord we know that you can take care of that too the lord bless you
thank you, team. Thank you, students. Um, we got to keep them in prayer and uh, continue to lift them up before the throne of grace. I have to say, it's really nice that my wife isn't going back to school. We are really enjoying the retired life for her, and uh, it's, it's been sweet. Um, two weeks from today, Bill and Beth Uni are going to be with us. We love Bill and Beth Uni. They carry a rich anointing, and I pray that you will purpose to be here in two weeks. And on the Saturday beforehand, we will be uh, having a prayer meeting from, uh, from 6 to 7, 7 to 8, 7 to 8 on Saturday night right here. You know, if, if, if we're expecting God to move, then I think we need to invest a little prayer. Right? We're not going to keep you past 8 o'clock. Don't think if you come, we're going to keep you here long. Nope, we're just going to have an hour of power. Right? And we're going to pray for God's anointing upon Bill and Beth Uni. So that will be exciting. Uh, next Sunday is our meal Sunday. And so we're looking forward to that. Bring your dish to share and plan to stick around and have lunch with us. It's always a special time. Uh, today is Promotion Sunday. And so our young people that are going into first grade and going into fifth grade will go up a class. So there will be adults down there to help shepherd that. Um, one thing I want to announce before I dismiss our kids is, you know, we, we miss Joyce Brett. She's always a, a faithful soul right here. And uh, her father is in a bad way, and she is basically becoming a caregiver uh, pretty much 24-7 for her father. His name is Paul. And so let's just take a moment. Joyce, I don't know if you're listening, but we're thinking about you. We miss you. And Father God, we just pray for Joyce. Give her strength. Give her grace. Give her supernatural uh, love and patience, God, to just be there for her father. We pray for Paul. We pray for the miracle that he needs in his lungs, Jesus, that you would open those lungs up, God, and help him to breathe. And we just speak life into Paul. And we thank you, God, for being with Joyce and her dad in Jesus' name. Now bless all of our students as they go to their class. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. And we got a great bunch of Eagle Mountain teachers. Let's show our appreciation as our students go. Amen. All right, students, you may be dismissed. Your microphone is making a lot of noise there. And that mic just needs to be tightened up. All right. Ron's giving me technical counsel here. Microphone just needs to be snugged up or what. Maybe it was just bent too much in your pocket. Okay. We'll try this here. Always good to get wise counsel. Well, I was thinking about it, you know, um, watching the Olympics some, um, and they got those starting blocks. And uh, I was thinking, you know, I kind of feel like that when I'm getting ready to preach sometime. It's like, ready, you know, set. And it's like, okay, go. And it's like, all right, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run, or at least I'm going to remember running. But uh, it's exciting to share the Word of God. And as uh, Willard mentioned, we got a good dose of the Word yesterday with Brother Rick. Thank you, Rick, for being willing to share. Uh, we had a, a wonderful unity breakfast, 36 men present, four churches. And uh, God really blessed that. Yeah, it was exciting. You know, it's, I believe God wants to build unity. You know, we're, we're not got our own little thing going on. We're all kingdom men if we love and serve Jesus Christ we're all on the same team amen so uh, had a great time yesterday and interestingly Rick spoke about the presence of God and the title of my sermon it's that is it I mean there was no collusion collaboration yeah, I didn't change it that is the title the presence of God so I believe that Rick and I are both in the spirit. What do you think? It's, a, it's amazing, but God can speak to two people at the same time and guide them in the same direction. So I don't have the cool Green Bay Packers story that Rick had. If you want to hear the story, uh, you can talk to Rick about that. But um, let's just back up just a little bit because I always like to kind of remind us, you know, we're, we're on a journey here this year. By the way, Daniel, good to have you with us here. Thank you. We're, that's my oldest son, and so we're glad to have him. So um, we're on a journey, and we're, we're heading towards John 14, 12. We're fixing our eyes on Jesus, and he told us 
that anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I go to the Father. And I just believe that Jesus really meant that when he said greater things. I think he was talking about the miracles and the power of God manifested that Jesus had. I mean, he was literally a walking miracle. You remember John wrote at the end of his gospel, he said that if everything Jesus did was written down, there would not be enough room for, to contain all the books in all the world. What we have is just an eyelash of, of the miracles that Jesus did. Uh, and so when Jesus told his disciples, you know, greater things, that was a tall order, but yet Jesus doesn't leave us alone. He's not expecting us to do it. Aren't you glad? All right, it's a little weak. He's not expecting us to do it. He gave us the Holy Spirit, right? And if you were to read on in John, he would say, this is the way you're going to do greater things. You're going to ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. And he said, and I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And he will be with you. He's with you. He will be in you. And he will guide you into all truth. So we've, we've got this because we can pray and because we have the Holy Spirit. So greater things are not out of our reach. Say, well, that was a long time ago that Jesus said that. Well, I think Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What do you think? If Jesus was doing healing back then, I think he still wants to do it now. If he's delivering people, then he's still doing it now. And I want it. I want it here. And I want it now. And I don't want to have to just say, well, you know, back in the days of Smith Wigglesworth, way back in the 1900s, God was doing some really cool stuff and wasn't that neat. No, I want to say, hey, you know what? Back in July, wasn't that Sunday cool when, when God did this? And man, I can't wait to see what he's going to do next Sunday. And I mean, you know, I want our kids I, I, want to, I want to see the day when we don't ever even dismiss our kids. I'm not saying on a regular basis, but on a Sunday when the presence of God is so thick and powerful that we just say, kids, we want you to be here and to just in, be a part of this. You know, I, I think we, our young people need to see the power of God today, right? We need that. And so, um, so we're, we're pursuing this vision of greater things. And we've also talked about the thermostat and how if you want to kind of up your spiritual temperature, then you can't just sit in your easy chair and wish for it. Boy, I sure wish it was a little bit warmer. Um, you know what? You got to get up unless you got a smart thermostat and then you can just talk. But otherwise, you got to get up and you got to turn the thermostat up a little bit and spiritually speaking, it's the same way. Say, boy, I'd really like to see God do greater things right here at Eagle Mountain, right here in my own life. Okay, brother, turn up your thermostat. You know, wishing isn't going to get us there. If you never do what you've never done, you'll never get what you've never got. Right? This is right out of Bill Uni's book. If you never do what you've never done, you'll never get what you've never got. But if we want greater things then we've got to turn up the thermostat. We've got to be hungry and thirsty. And so uh, I want to talk about the presence of God today because I believe that is such a critical part of experiencing greater things. That, that this connection, I mean, we talked about it, uh, how there is, there is peace in your presence, right? We talked about that. The presence of God is, is a vital thing, and I want to unpack this a little bit today um, because this is, this is just a vital topic. So let's just start out with what is the presence of God. That, you, we could think a lot of things, so I want to break this down here a little bit, and let's talk about what is the presence of God. I'll start with the omnis. How many of you are familiar with the three omnis when it comes to God? It's like, whoa, what's that? Like one of those big screens? The Omnimax? No, it's, it's that God is omnipotent. What does omnipotent mean? He is all-powerful. There's nothing God can't do. And some people throw the stupid illustration out there. It's like, well, can God build a rock he can't lift? And it's, 
Really? God is omnipotent. He can do anything. He created the universe out of the spoken word. He's all-powerful. Okay? The second omni is, is he is omniscient. He is all what? Knowing. The word science is in there, right? Omniscient. God is all-knowing. There is nothing that God doesn't know. God is never surprised. God never realizes anything. I just realized, nope, God never says that. You know, God always knows. He never forgets. He's always spot on. He knows the end from the beginning. And so God is all-powerful. He's all-knowing. And then the third omni is this thing we called omnipresence, meaning God is everywhere all at one time. Now, this, this omnipresence is, is a powerful thing. It's, it's Psalm 139. It's like, where can I go from your spirit, right? The first half of Psalm 139, before a word is on my tongue, you know it. He's like, God is all around me. I try to get away from God. He says, I can run, and, and he's there. I can go to the, the, the sunset, and he's there. God, where? He's everywhere, Right? And so God is omnipresent in this Psalm 139 sense. It's also in the Jesus sense where he says, I am with you always. I like to tell the people that fly, just remember Jesus said, lo, I am with you always. Just remember that when you fly. This is a fact, right? That God is everywhere. You know, I was thinking about it. There's, there's really only one place that I believe eventually God will not be. And that's hell. You know, people think of hell as a sense of, of fire and all of that. And, and that sounds bad enough. If you've ever been burned, you, you know, we can imagine the horror of that. But the worst thing of hell will be the total absence of God. You know, you've heard people say foolishly, said, oh, I've had my hell on earth. When I die, I'm going to go to heaven. And I'm thinking, oh, you don't even know. The, the hell of not having the light of God the goodness of God, the love of God. Hell is a place where God is completely absent. You know, it wasn't ever created for men, right? It was created for the devil and his angels. You remember who the first occupants of this is going to be? It's going to be the, the Antichrist and the false prophet, and then Satan's going to join them, and then there's the white throne judgment. So nobody's in hell right now, but it's the destiny of all those who reject Jesus Christ. That's one place where God will not be, and that's what's going to make it hell. But God is everywhere. We can sit here today, and we can say God is in the house, and that would be factually true, right? I could say that God is going to go with you when you go home, and that would be factually true. You cannot escape from the presence of God. God sees every click of your mouse, God knows every thought, right? Every, every part of you, every part of our minds, God is there and he knows it. But this is not the presence of God that I talked about here just a bit ago about being so crucial to experiencing God in a, in a unique way. What I'm talking about, and I almost changed the title, to the manifest presence of God. The presence of God is a fact. He is omnipresent. But the manifest presence of God is when you experience God, you feel God. How many of you know what I'm talking about? The manifest presence of God. When you don't need somebody to tell you, about, oh, God's here. Oh, I know he's here because I'm feeling God. I'm experiencing God. You know, experience is a really popular word today. And, and there is no greater experience than to experience the manifest presence of God where you know that God is not just in the house, but he is working in your life. You know, I love Jesus being with me always, and I love Psalm 139, but I, 
I long for the manifest presence of God where it is just not like sort of a faith statement. I, I believe God's here. But really, it's a, I, you don't even need me to say that because you are, you are weeping. You are kneeling. You are up here. You are, you are feeling God with the very core of your being. And that is the, the I am with you always. I believe that's what Jesus wants for us. To experience the manifest presence of God. You say, well, what, what is that in, in the Bible? What is that? It's Moses at the burning bush. The manifest presence. Nobody, nobody needed to tell Moses, you know, hey, this is, this is something special. Moses is like, you know, taking off his sandals and he knew that was God. It was, it was the Israelites when they... When they came up to the Red Sea with the Egyptians hot behind them, and Moses holds his staff over the waters, and the waters part. I remember the story about a guy who was all excited about how God parted the Red Sea, and some smart-alecky liberal <clears throat> came up to him, excuse me, and said, uh, well, you know, the, the Red Sea was really only four inches deep and you know it wasn't really any it was the reed sea and anybody could have walked through it and the 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 other guy the normal guy he just he's he's like oh hallelujah praise god and 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 the the liberal guy was like didn't i i just told you that they could have just walked through the sea no 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 god drowned the entire egyptian army in four inches of water you know i was like Whatever you way you want to look at this, God did a miracle, right? The manifest presence of God. And it was, the, it was the fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day that the Israelites followed when they were spent those 40 years in the wilderness. That was the manifest presence of God. If you wanted to know God was in the camp, all you had to do was look over there by the tabernacle. And there's the flame. And there's the cloud. God was in the house. It was the glory that was on the glory seat in the tabernacle. It was the manna that came down. The manifest presence of God was the water that came out of the rock. The manifest presence of God is when Elijah smote the water and it parted and the presence of God came and took him up to heaven. It was when Elijah picked up that mantle and he smote the waters and he said, where now is the God of Elijah? And the rivers parted. That's the manifest presence of God. It was when they threw Elisha's body into that tomb of that dead guy and that dead guy came running out of that tomb too. I mean, you know, I mean, it was a miracle. It was Naaman when he dipped in the Jordan River and came up leprosy free. The manifest presence of God was Jesus when he walked on the earth. You want to talk about God made manifest. It was Jesus when he walked on the earth and he touched lepers and the leprosy disappeared. It was when he raised the widow's son. It was when he called Lazarus out of the tomb. It was when he turned the water into wine. It's when he opened the eyes of the blind. It's when he delivered the demoniac. This was the manifest presence of God. Jesus said, you want to see God? Look right here. Right? He is the manifest presence of God. And Jesus said to his disciples, you know what? Just like I manifested God, you'll do even greater things. The manifest presence of God changed the room. It was powerful. The manifest power of God was, was the cloud in Solomon's temple. It was Gideon in the wine press encountering the angel of the Lord. It was all these miracles of the Old Testament that said God is here. So well, those are good old stories. I believe it's the same God that we serve today. The same God. You know, it was, it was the fog in Azusa Street. The manifest presence of God. It didn't stop when the last apostle died, as some would try to tell us. The manifest presence of God shows up where people have faith in Jesus to be the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, the manifest 
presence of God continues in Acts chapter 29, and that's where we live, right? I remember as a young man, Lake Williams, Lake, not Lake Williams, Lake Springfield Christian Assembly, I was a young teenager, and we'd had chapel service, uh, kind of vespers around the fire, and a storm came in, and I looked up in that sky, and the lightning was shooting every which direction. It wasn't raining anywhere, and the sky was clear, but there was lightning that was filling the sky. And I went to bed that night. I wasn't particularly spiritual, I'm just going to say. But I went to bed that night, and the thought on my mind was, God is real. I saw God. I felt God in that. When Marianne and I went down to Brownsville to the, uh, to the assembly, uh, to the revival that was going on down there back in the 90s, I saw the manifest presence of God in the miracles and then the conviction as people fled to the altar, as people were slain in the Holy Spirit and people were healed and delivered. It was the presence and the power of God. And when Marianne and I came back from that, and that was probably 1996 in the fall, we came back and, and we, we tried to tell our church what we saw. And Marianne did more talking than I did. As, and she wasn't scheduled to preach, but uh, we had a hard time getting the microphone out of her hand. But I tell you what, the power of God was in that service. As we just talked about the presence and the power of God, God showed up in that place. People's lives were touched. I felt an anointing on my life like I've rarely ever felt. And then afterwards, Daniel, you remember, you were about eight years old, and, and, and it was so obvious to us, God touched you, and we asked you after church, what was God doing? And you remember what you said? Felt like I had a thousand showers out of the eight-year-old mouth. The, the manifest presence of God that changes things. Not just that we say, oh yeah, that was a sweet service, I, I felt God. But to say, whoa, God touched my life. There was something that God did in that service. And I just believe that we don't have to, we shouldn't have to just like look backwards and remember, but rather to be able to say, I believe God's going to manifest his presence today. That God is going to move today because God hasn't ever lost his identity. He's never forgotten that he's a miracle working God. He is willing and able to flow through his people today. But we have to want the manifest presence of God. Are we hungry for the manifest presence of God? You know, people talk about it when God shows up. I, I've been sad at, at times in my life. Our first church was founded in 1934. The first church we pastored in Root House, Illinois, was founded by a very strong Pentecostal lady named Mae Blaney, who got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and her husband divorced her because of it. And she went on to be a preacher, and she came to that old railroad town and she preached Jesus. She was a force to be reckoned with. And I heard the stories when I went there in 89 about how people from the community used to come and watch through the windows to see what was going on in that Pentecostal church. And I thought to myself with sadness, there wouldn't be anything really to see at that point. You know, we were, we were having good services, and it was, it was nice. But God wants to do more than nice. God wants to see people filled with joy and power and excitement and jumping and shouting. And, and if you ever see me jumping and shouting, you know it's the Holy Spirit. I, I, I couldn't jump when I was in my 20s, but, but if you see me jumping now, you know that's God. God wants to light us up. And I'd, I'd, love to, I'd love to have that reputation here in Tuscola. Man, I don't know about those people at Eagle Mountain, but I'm going to go just to watch because God is doing something, stirring those people up. There's an excitement there, and there's stuff going on. And so I just, I just believe that God wants to give us fresh fire from the Holy Spirit. I'd love to have services where people just don't even want to leave. 
Right? Sometimes it's like a raid commercial at the end of church. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Ah, raid, and everybody, Phew. it's like, wow, okay, well, God bless. <laughs> um, but to have it where, where nobody wants to leave because God is just doing stuff, I, I believe for that. I, I, I am honestly trying to whet your appetite, okay? I'm just trying to, to make you remember. Maybe you experienced this years ago or in, in your childhood, but I, I don't want it just to be memories. I want our kids to have memories of God moving and seeing people healed and hearing the testimonies of people delivered. People say, you know what? I was bound by drugs. I was bound by alcohol. Jesus set me free. I had a leg that would not work, and last Sunday God touched it, and here I am, pain-free and walking. You know, that, say, oh, that's just a bunch of hype. No, if it's your leg that's healed, that is not hype. Right? I think we got to lay this scoffer hat, put that aside, and say, you know what, I just believe that Jesus can still heal, that he can still deliver, that he's still saving people. I'd love to have services where before I ever even got to the invitation, people were jumping up and coming down to this altar. I'm going to tell you, I'm a little disappointed that by my records, we've had one person give their life to Jesus here in nearly eight months of services. That bothers me. I want to see people come to Jesus where they are sitting there white-knuckled on the pew. You remember what that looks like? They're, they're like white-knuckled on the pew, and it's like, oh, and finally they just let go and run up here. And Jesus, you know, it's like, God's still doing that stuff just because we don't see it, or maybe it's never something you've seen, but God is pouring out his spirit in these last days. Do you think Illinois needs a spiritual awakening? I was praying for Chicago this morning. That is a, that is a step. You know, we got the, the Democratic National Convention coming to Chicago. We need to be praying for Chicago. Let me tell you, I know some of the guys that preach up there, and they love Jesus, and they love their city, and we need to pray that God pours his spirit out upon Chicago, and God does some awesome things and brings uh, people to where they need to be. All right. So, what can we do to welcome the manifest presence of God? That's a good question, isn't it? I've, I've told you how wonderful it is. I've told you stories. Well, what can we do, Pastor? What can we do? I think the very worst answer is this. We could say, well, really nothing. You know, God's sovereign. He's going to show up when he wants to show up, and we'll just have to wait. I do not believe that. Let the record show. I don't believe that it's just a matter of, oh, we got lucky today. God showed up. No, God shows up where he finds people that want him. Right? It's Jeremiah. God says, you will seek me and you'll find me when? When you seek me with all your heart. Are we all in for the presence and the power of God? So there are some things that we can do, and I want to give you three quick keys to how we can help welcome the manifest presence of God. No, the first is prayer. You know, there's no doubt that the Acts Church was supernatural, but if you notice, they also were a praying church. They were praying every time they got together. Acts chapter 2, it says what? They were devoted to prayer. Right? And everything you see in Acts, it's like either before a prayer meeting, during a prayer meeting, or after a prayer meeting. I mean, God used that church in prayer ministry. And I really am convinced in my heart that this is something that God wants to stir up in us. That's why we've got this prayer meeting here in a couple weeks. Because, you know, Bill and Beth are wonderful people. But without Jesus, they're nothing. Right? You know, even Jesus couldn't do much when he showed up when people didn't have faith, right? I want Bill and Beth to show up and to find us so fired up and expecting that God just is, is just large in the house, the manifest presence of God right here at Eagle Mountain. And so we're going to pray. But, you know, it, it needs to be something that is a part of us. In the book of Acts, they were praying and prison cells opened in the book of Acts, they were praying and dead people came back to life. In the book of Acts, they were praying and the devil's henchmen got struck blind. 
right? When the, when the church was praying and seeking God, God showed up and did miracles in that house. You know, praying people, hungry for more of God, they get what they pray for. Deb, I know you guys on Wednesday night, you were priming the prayer pump. You know, that's, that's what it takes is a church that is praying. I, God isn't cheap. He responds to people who are willing to pray the price for his presence. When we pray, you know what that does? That doesn't just welcome God, but it changes us. Are we praying? for a manifest presence of God. Let me just ask you now, no hands, but how many of you honestly are praying for your church to experience greater things? I don't don't want to see hands because it might hurt my feelings. But I would hope that every one of you would say, you know what, I, I have been praying for my church. I could pray a little more. I hope this kind of pokes you a little bit to say, you know what, I am going to pray. I do want God to show up. I want people to get saved. I want, when I bring a friend to church, I want to know that they're going to experience God when they get here, right? That's what we want. We don't want them to come get their ears tickled. We want them to come into face-to-face contact with Jesus, right? He is the way and the truth and the life. He is the one that heals people and sets them free. So, praying, and I want to say a thank you to our intercessors on Tuesday morning. Thank you, thank you, thank you for those ladies who gather on Tuesday mornings and pray because it makes a difference. It matters, and I appreciate your praying hearts. But all of us need to be intercessors. We can't just say, well, I'm not an intercessor. We all have the privilege to pray. So we can pray in the manifest presence of God, but we can also worship in the manifest presence of God. You know, in that five guys prayer meeting we talked about in Acts chapter 12, what were they doing? They were worshiping and fasting and seeking God, and God showed up. He manifested his presence because they were fasting, worshiping, and seeking God. I believe there's something to this fasting thing. You know, I talked to you back in April about fasting, and it's something that Marianne and I have have now embraced into our weekly schedule. And I want to encourage you, if you've not stepped into that, there, there is something to it. And Marianne and I have talked, and we've said, you know, I can't really explain it, but there is something different going on in my heart, and I can trace it back to that time when we started setting aside fasting time. Well, I don't know if that works, Pastor. Well, you give it a try. I triple dog dare you. Again, that's two Sundays now. I triple dog dared you. Give it a try. See what happens. Well, I'll get hungry. Ah. Wouldn't hurt any of us to get a little hungry. But if it helps us get closer to God, it is worth it. It is worth it. It is worth it. So, um, so worshiping. Worshiping is, is a, a powerful way uh, I, I really believe that God wants to do more in our worship time on Sunday morning. You know, I've, I've been in churches' services where God's manifest presence was there. And it was usually preceded by a powerful time of people getting involved in worship. It is great to sing songs. But I think that God wants to take us to the next level, to really connect us with God, to commune with God, to have a conversation, to hear his voice, and then to be obedient, to do whatever he tells us to do, right? Some of you are saying, oh, pastor, you're getting weird now. I'm telling you, if we never do what we have never done, we will never get what we have never gotten. I think God wants to take us to a new level in our worship time. And to come to church expecting. And this, this 945 prayer time, that's an intentional thing because I, I know what it's like. I, there was a time when I wasn't a pastor. You are trying to get out the door and the kids are acting up and you get to church and, and you're just like, <laughs> and you sit down and about three songs later, you're just like, okay, I'm settled now. Oh, 
and it's over. But if we get here early and spend time seeking God, you will get more out of the worship time. So I want to say to our worship team, thank you. Thank you for leading us into the presence of God. You know, they have a big job to fulfill here. It's not just singing songs, but it is helping all of us make that connection to go from the mundane to the supernatural. And so I appreciate our worship team and all that they do. All right. Now, third thing, obedience. We can pray in the manifest presence of God. We can worship in the manifest presence of God. But if we're not being obedient to God, you're going to grieve away the Holy Spirit. I'll try to keep this short. Do you believe me? You're really scoffers. I have a spirit of scoffing here. But this is important. This is important to understand that the way you live your life before God affects what happens when we all come together to experience God as a congregation. Now, I don't know that you feel that, but I'm hoping that you will be open to thinking that. You know, sometimes we look at church as, as a place, well, you know, Jesus said, weary and heavy laden, come, and I'll give you rest. Yes, but that's not really supposed to be every Sunday. Okay? There are Sundays when, yes, we, we are doing well to get our tails in the door, and I get that. But there, I believe, should be more of an overcoming spirit when we get ourselves ready to come to church. You know, it used to be going to church really started on Saturday night. A little soul searching, a little Bible time, a little prayer, because tomorrow I'm going to be in church. Tomorrow I'm going to be in the house of God. Tomorrow God might want to use me in that service. And so there is that sense of, of responsibility. But I would just say to you that, that our level of obedience makes us either wider or narrower conduits of the power of God. I want to be a wide conduit of the power of God. I don't want God to just give me a little trickle. Now you might think, well, Pastor, if you got a little trickle, maybe we get out of here sooner. But that's not really the goal, is it? Okay, thank you, Willard. Um, the goal is not to see if we can get done in time. Because there's no time. We, we, we are here to experience the manifest presence of God. And I guarantee if God begins to show up in our services and do supernatural things, you're not going to care about lunch. Because you're going to be hungry for what God is doing. And say, well, pastor, you're talking all these kind of hypotheticals. It's only hypothetical if we don't pursue it. But I believe that this whole thing of obedience, it matters to God. That, that we can grieve the Holy Spirit and push him away. And um, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 to 7, Steve, if you've got that verse. This is John, the apostle. He says, this is the message we've heard from him and declare to you, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. Now, you probably know the next verse. <clears throat> but if we walk in the light, that's obedience, isn't it? As he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Imagine if, if every one of us brought our A game to Jesus every week. And we have been walking with him. And we've been praying. We've been fellowshipping with the Lord. We've been spending time in the Bible. We have not been grouchy. We, we have not held people in unforgiveness. We have been polite. We have been kind. We have been bold for Jesus. And then we get here. How many of you think that things might happen a little more right here? If we brought our A game of obedience. I mean, my marriage is better when I obey God. I can only imagine that my relationship with God who knows all and sees all is better when I walk in obedience. 
So I want to challenge you, church. Um, this obedience thing is, is huge because then we bring our A game. We've got the Word of God dwelling in us richly. And so uh, what happens in your week affects what happens here. And so let's just keep that in mind. Jesus, I want to see you. I want manifest presence. Okay, last thing. How do I know if I'm experiencing the presence of God? Let's do Psalm 1611. This is David. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. How do you know if you're in the presence of God? You're joyful. If you're happy and you know it, tell your face. Yeah, I think he's alive. Sometimes it's a tough crowd when I'm up here. I'm just saying here, I try to bring out some of my best material, and sometimes I just get a, hmm, it's tough, Jerry. You're a joke teller. You know how that is. Sometimes it's just tough. But when we've been hanging out in the presence of God, there is joy. And did you know that joy brings his best friend peace along with him? Right? And peace brings love. And you can read in, in uh, Galatians 5 about all of the fruit of the Spirit that happens. But the biggest sign that we have been walking in the presence of God during the week as we, is that we are joyful people. I was asking Gail this week, I don't know how many of you know Kent Conover. How many of you know Kent Conover? Okay. You know what? He is one of the most joyful people I have ever met. I mean, he's got a He's got a big button on his shirt that says, Got Jesus. And I mean, if you ask him about the button, you better have some time. Right? Because that guy has got a smile on his face and a good word for God every time I have ever talked to him. He is always the same and he's always joyful. Now, some of you know him better say, Oh, well, there was this one time. He's human. Okay? And I know he's got an outgoing personality, but I can tell you this Ken Conover, I believe walks in the presence of God because he has joy. Now, I know life gets hard sometimes, and I know it's hard to put a, a happy face on things, but, you know, we're not really pursuing happiness because happiness depends on what happens. And sometimes bad stuff happens in life, and there's nothing you can do about it. But you know what? If we go through it with Jesus and in his presence, we can have joy no matter what. Do you believe that? In his presence, there is joy. You know, it's, it's so much better than pursuing the fake of happiness. Because happiness runs dry. you got to have the next thing. But God gives us joy in his presence. The confidence that it's going to be okay. And I want to tell you, if you got God and you're walking with him, it will be okay. Amen? Well, I don't know if I've convinced you or not. But there is something out there called the manifest presence of God. And I am hungry for that. Not so we can show off. Not so that we can have longer services. I want all of us to experience the power and the presence of God. I want to see people run to the altar and call upon the name of the Lord. I want to see people healed and delivered right in the middle of worship service. You know, I, I want to see this place filled because people are saying, you know what? I was there at Eagle Mountain and I felt the presence of God and they want to come back. You know, I, I want this. Jesus wants this, which is much more important. He wants us to represent him well. And he gives us the Holy Spirit. And so um, today the take home is this. It is God's will for his church to experience his manifest presence. But we have to position ourselves for this outpouring through our prayers, our worship, and our obedience. What happens next and the next day and the next determines what's going to happen next Sunday. You know, Bill and Beth, as wonderful folks as they are, 
They can't make up for our lack. We have to do our part. I want to strongly encourage you. Let's be praying for next Sunday, the next, and the next, and the next. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. I'd <clears throat> shake you up a little bit. The power of God. Okay, let me just ask you a question. How many of you have been in services where you know the power of God was in the house? Let me see your hand. You, you knew, okay. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, you, you know when it's there and you know when it's not. Right? I want that for this church. And if you've really felt that, then you want that too. And it's not something we manufacture. It is God. But we can pray and we can worship and we can walk in the light as he is in the light and the rest is God. And he will show up. He will be what he's promised that he will be. All right, I want to first ask, is there anybody in the house, you're not a Christian, and you don't know Jesus, and you would like to, somebody out there in Facebook, you're not a Christian, because that is God's biggest heart, isn't it, for everybody to come to Christ. Is there anybody in the house say, you know what, I need to recommit my life to Christ. I've gotten away from God. You've been talking about these greater things and the manifest presence of God, and it just reminds me how far I am away from that. Is there anybody who say, you know, I need to recommit my life to Jesus today. I need to recommit my life to Christ. Is there anybody? Out there in Facebook, God sees your hand. Vicki, I see your hand over there. You know, this is, this is the way this goes down. It's, it's, it's not something that's, that's hard. It is simply saying, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I know I'm a sinner, Jesus. I believe you died on the cross. And I confess you as my Lord and Savior. And today I recommit my life to you, Jesus. I am yours. Use me for your glory. Forgive me of all my sins. And fill me afresh with the Holy Spirit. Amen. A prayer to that effect. And God hears that. But now here's, here's the next thing. I believe God is stirring hearts. I don't know who. But if this message has gained any traction in your soul and you're like, you know, I want that. I want that. I'm just going to ask you to do whatever God tells you. You want to raise a hand? You want to come up here and pray? We can't put this in a box, but God, I want this. I want the manifest presence of God in my church. I am not content about hearing the old stories. I want it to be a new story. If that's you, would you lift a hand or come up here and join me? And just say, God, I want that. I want the manifest presence of God in my church, in my heart, in my family. I want more of God. I am not content to just look back. I want a fresh move of God. You can lift a hand. You can come up here. We're going to pray. Just let's just seek God right now. Church, if you want to come up 